Hmm? No, we don't. Call to order the City Council meeting for Tuesday, April 18th, 2023. If I could get a roll call, please. Kesme. Here. Grote. Here. Jepson. Here. Johnson. Here. Cronenberger. Here. Shell. Here. Montgomery. Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Could I get a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. We got a motion from Diane. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second from Lisa. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. It carries. Uh, moving us to public input. Public input is intended to afford the public an opportunity to address concerns to the City Council. The public input will be no longer than 30 minutes in total length and each speaker will have no more than three minutes to speak. Speakers may address topics relevant to the governance of the city. Speakers must sign up in advance and must provide their name, address, and the topic they intend to address. Comments must be on topic, respectful, pertinent to city business, and adhere to the applicable data privacy rules. Any speaker that violates these rules will be asked to sit down, and if the speaker refuses to comply, they may be removed from the meeting. Speakers shall not address topics that are subject of a public hearing. All such comments shall be made at the public hearing. The City Council will not generally act on issues raised by the public input, but may choose to schedule consideration of the item on a future agenda. Uh, we're going to bend the rules a little bit tonight because we've got Brad Anderson, our county commissioner, and he has a presentation to give, so we're going to give him more than three minutes. Brad, you're up first. You are, you are uh, like stretching that a little bit because it will not be a presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, glad to be here. Congratulations to the new council members who have been seated. I haven't been here since that happened. I've been a little bit everywhere. Um, what you're seeing in front of you, and I will leave a copy for the public to look at, is uh, the five-year road plan. And it's one of the things that I, um, I use every time I go to our uh, annual township meetings, because obviously they're really interested in county roads and what's happening in their neighborhood. The interesting thing about the county road plan, um, obviously you can see it's two pages for the five years. And when you go to the back page, that's from 2015 when I was first elected to the county board. The 2015 had uh, $24 million in a five-year road plan. The road plan we've got forward in front of us right now is $64 million. We are attacking our county roads and we are going to get them in very good drivable shape. We're gonna, first we'll get through as you see, um, there's a lot of mill and fills and overlays to get the condition of the surface good so we have good drivable uh, road surfaces. And when we're done with this five-year road plan, this pretty much gets us through all of our county paved roads, um, the ones that need resurfacing. Then we'll start working on the next five-year phase will be a lot of construction to improve safety along those county roads. When I talk about safety, you may think uh, I'm talking about guardrails and that kind of stuff. We're continually doing that. What we're talking about is taking those ditches and getting a less slope. If you come out the new 14 and you get to the old 14 going through uh, down to Sogan, you will notice that the ditches go from something like this to something like this, which means if you go off the road, you're going to roll over. You're not just going to go off the road. And that's what I talk about safety. The other part is about widening shoulders. And in some areas we can, in some areas when the bluff country of Goodyear County, you're confined to what you're confined to. Um, but I, uh, the other piece of this that's really important is uh, when we first adopted the local option sales tax for roads, and it has to go to construction on roads. That's how it's adopted. Um, half a cent sales tax, uh, we were projected to get anywhere from two to $2.3 million. Ever since that's been fully implemented, 
it's been running $4 million a year. That has really contributed to the amount of dollars we can spend on roads. The other piece we did was several years ago, um, for several years in a row, we added 200,000 to the construction program. So first year it was 200, the next year it was 400, 600, and now we've got it up to 800, and we've stopped there. So we went from 1.3 million of levy dollars to 2.1 million of levy dollars. So those two things combined is what has driven this uh, road plan. And then there are some other grants and things and stuff that comes in there. But I just wanted to point out that we are making a concerted effort. One of the things when I was first elected, um, I didn't want to be borrowing money for road projects. It's just too expensive to pay the interest on top of it. So the work we did on County 14, $4 million to make that extension, $2 million for the, uh, was our contribution to the interchange at Hayter. So those $6 million, they were cash. We did not borrow money. We put away the dollars from local option sales tax and dedicated it to that. Now that those two projects are done, the next one on 52, the only county road that won't have an interchange or be disconnected from 52 in Goodyear County is County Road 7 down by Zimbrota. And it only comes in from one side, it does not go across. And there is a study between MnDOT and Goodyear County on what that intersection should look like in the future. And we hopefully ha will have some answers this fall and then we can start planning how we're gonna address that in the future. Um, other things that happen at the county, uh, you know, we're constantly working on any number of things. Housing, as, as uh, Laura can tell you, we're working on housing continually. We have put in place a few years ago a housing trust fund where we put $100,000 every year, and that has now grown to a point where we can actually do something with it. I think there's 400 and some thousand in that fund that can actually address some, some things. Um, how we use CARES dollars, how we used um, the ARPA dollars, uh, some to the county, but really a lot of it about ongoing uh, benefit for citizens in how we spent those dollars. Um, I have to say, uh, I sit on the state AMC board, Association of Minnesota Counties board, representing 11 counties in southeast Minnesota. And as I listen to what some counties did with those dollars, I'm like, mm, you could have done better. <laughs> Goodyear County, I think, did a pretty good job of balancing how we use those dollars, how we're addressing some uh, issues with those dollars, um, and going forward, that will make a difference for our county. Um, I didn't really have a whole heck of a lot more to say, but I'm just, Glad to be here, glad to welcome you all to the public realm, those new people that are at the table here, um, and enjoy the ride. Any questions? Thank you, Brad. Thanks, Brad. Mr. O'Gorman. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I'm hoping that this is redundant, but the uh, EDA met and had on their agenda about the land rent out at Hardwood Estates. And to my knowledge, Hardwood Estates is zoned R2, or at least that's what the city website says. And to my knowledge, farming isn't allowed in an R2 zone. So I'm hoping that when you guys discuss this tonight, because this is the only opportunity I've got to speak, that um, you keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. All right, public hearings. Uh, we'll begin with resolution 2681, vacating certain easements located in the city uh, to the county of Goodhue and the state of Minnesota. Neil, would you like to start that? <laughs> As part of our agreement with the, the fair board, you remember back last year, we were going to vacate uh, 
the streets that are inside of the uh, fairgrounds property. Um, I'll scroll up to the map. Stoughton Street um, that run east and west, York Street that runs north and south, and Cannons, part of Cannon Street that runs um, east and west are the streets uh, <coughs> going to be vacated if, if it goes through tonight. But it's all within the, the fairgrounds property. Okay. And that was part of the, if, uh, for those of you that were here, um, it's part of the agreement that we have with the fair board. Okay. We will open up the public hearing for resolution 2681, the vacating the easements. If anybody would like to speak for the public hearing. Mr. Kurtz. Hello, council. Uh, I thought when we started this, Dahl and Floyd were involved in it some way, going up the hills that needed to get vacated because one of those streets used to be an entrance to the fairgrounds. And I just haven't heard any more about that. Is there something you can bring me up to date, bring us up to date on Dahl and Floyd? This is the map that we've been using all along. Um, I really don't know where Dow and Floyd are, but this map has been presented to the fair board since the beginning. I'm just saying in, in conversation, they have come up. That's why I've got it in my head and I'm asking. They're above the pool, they go up through the woods. They're used to, one of those streets used to be an entrance to the fairgrounds. Uh, that's the reason I'm asking in, in regards to that. Uh, can you tell how many more steps there is here before this is complete? Uh, this land deal and what we're doing here? We it's have. been two months. It, it was two months yesterday that I signed the, the paperwork. And I haven't seen anything or heard anything from our attorney or anybody. So, uh, Greg, does Dow Street come down onto the fairgrounds? I can't really tell by this map. And I apologize for being uh, not up to speed on that part of the And map. I can see where Floyd is, but is Floyd still technically a street? It's in that wooded area that I believe. It, um, but that's all, it's, it's filled in, it's not an active road. No, it's not an active road, but when, when this all began, those two streets were mentioned in the conversation we had been having. Yep, and seen. yeah, I've got the map in front of me here, the one that, that Neil's speaking of, uh, of these streets that are in the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if that was still part of it, but. I don't know if those are still recognized as streets to be <clears throat> I mean, are they vacated? The uh, Dow and Floyd? No. So it's Dow. Dow. D O W. Yeah. Okay. So Dow and Floyd. Which do look like they come in towards the fairground. From the south, they come in. Okay. And, so and, in other words, you don't want an entrance up there. You would like them vacated. Well, we can't. No, not anymore. But but that was always part of it. Okay. But you don't want them. No. Okay. So we, if they're still somewhere on a map, then we should vacate those streets also? I don't, it's never was part of the agreement, and I don't know if there's water mains in there or, or what we have on the map is what we're speaking about today. Okay. And, and uh, just so I understand too, and the rest of us do, Stoughton, has a water main that comes in through it, correct? That's and that was, that description was uh, signed off on. We have a water main easement going across all, and it zigzags up in the fairgrounds. It's, it doesn't follow the streets. So we did a, uh, an easement description that the fairgrounds has signed off on already. That was part, also part of our agreement. So the, the agreement is that we have to keep that. Easement. So you're being, go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. The agreement that was signed, we still have to have that easement. That's already done. Okay. Yep. 
what we have left to complete is to adopt this resolution tonight. You got the second reading of that little piece of land on the agenda, on the consent agenda. When mm -hmm. that gets done, that's an ordinance, gets published, and then we can transfer that over and then everything will be complete. Is there, are, are we looking at any window time-wise? Well, it's got to get recorded or uh, uh, published. It's an ordinance, so it'll be a couple of weeks to get the publishing done, and then we'll send it over for recording. Okay, I, I've noticed on the plat maps that it's, the fairgrounds has disappeared from there. Just kind of wondering too, if if it was that's where it was moving along at, because it doesn't appear on the county plat maps anymore, that we own that piece of property that we're, this whole thing is about. So you're talking about county records, not city records? So that's a county, county. issue? I don't have the answer for that then. Yeah. That's a county thing. That stuff has been recorded because <coughs> that can be recorded. And when we did this agreement, it was stated that this takes some time. That's why we did the agreement. We have to go through public hearings. You know, we got two readings of an ordinance. We've got a lot of stuff that takes time. So that's why we did, and we weren't going to do this unless we had an agreement signed. So this, this does take time. So, uh, but I would say within a month, because we're on our second reading of the ordinance mm -hmm. tonight, and uh, we should be able to wrap it up. Yep. And <clears throat> just a couple other questions. Uh, I was told that these streets are being vacated, had to be surveyed, so you knew that they were where they were. Has that ever been done, the streets? I was told that by Schofield and Red Wing and the county. The proper way to do it is to have that surveyed so you know exactly what you're vacating. I'm just asking if you guys know that. Well, um, if you're vacating it, doesn't really matter because it all goes over to the landowner. Okay, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. That's that's for clarification. My thinking is. I don't know. How do you feel about that? Is that a one Is that a question for our attorney? I think so. Yeah, the, the we don't need to have it surveyed. The, <coughs> the streets are what they are on the plat maps, and that the street goes away. Uh, it's vacated. The uh, easement takes its place. Uh, so there was no survey requirement either under the charter or under applicable statute. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that, that's just what I was told. The proper way to do it is to survey that so you know exactly what you're giving up and we're getting. We, we did do the, the legal description and the survey for the easement. So we do know with, with specificity with the easement the city is retaining in lieu of vacating the streets. Well, will we be getting copies of that survey and stuff then too, or not? Yeah, you, your attorneys have, or your attorney has gotten copies of everything all along. Okay. So, yep, we can okay. make sure you guys have what you need for that. Okay. Uh, one other, last thing I just wanted to ask, and maybe I shouldn't be asking this, but, uh, I've talked to a few of you in regards to our relationship with the city, if it was gonna stay the same, and I've been told that, why should it change? I'm just wanting to get a, uh, maybe six yeses that that's what it's gonna be. We've got a lot of events coming up at the fairgrounds this year, bringing uh, a lot of people into town. And some of the services that, that we need have been kind of in a gray area of are we gonna to get to use them or not, so. Have you decided on nothing will change? There's no decision to be made tonight because we're having the public hearing about the vacating of the, the street I'm just easement. I think it's, we've said since the beginning, it's our intent to keep the relationship well, similar to the intent, quo, intent and yes, you will is two different things. Because we, like I say, we've got a lot of things coming this summer. Your needs are changing, aren't they? Yep. Right. So asking for more services is changing the game as well. So it's our intent to continue to have a positive relationship and to give those services to you. But if those needs change, we have to reevaluate. 
but it's our intent to keep a good cordial relationship with the fair board. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Is there anybody else that would like to speak during the public hearing? <coughs> Anybody else that would like to speak for the public hearing, take two. Final call to speak, public hearing. Seeing nobody come, we will close the public hearing. Uh, council, any discussion for resolution 2681, the vacating of certain easements? With no discussion, I would look for a motion to approve. Hello. Motion for Mr. Gesme. i second. second. Got a second. I think Lisa got in there first, so Lisa got in there first. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And it carries. That moves us on to item B in public hearings. The introduction and first reading of Ordinance 393, an interim ordinance establishing a moratorium within the city of land use and subdivision applications for the construction and development of residential treatment facilities. Neil, would you like to explain that, please? Yeah. Um, I got an interesting call one day about uh, a residential treatment facility and uh, placing it, another one, in, this, in the city of Cannon Falls. And in speaking with uh, Shelley, I asked uh, the question of whether uh, uh, this particular particular facility would be able to put in another treatment facility, just like the one we got over uh, across the highway. Um, it came back as, yeah, it looks like that could happen. So I thought, well, you know what, we should maybe put a moratorium on uh, uh, residential treatment facilities, simply because I think you guys need to talk about them. Um, it wasn't that long ago we had uh, uh, some issues we talked with the, uh, the facility we have now in town. They, they came to the board and, and the council and had discussions. Um, I think uh, it would be best if, uh, um, to look at our ordinances and where these uh, facilities can be placed. And because uh, right now I think it's an R2 that it, or what, what RB, that they can be placed in an RB and and that is mixed well within a bunch of residential housing. And uh, so that is the, the thought process. Um, I don't think the council would like a surprise landing in their laps with, uh, with another residential treatment facility of magnitude size um, coming to town without your having it in the right district. So. What this does is, is puts a moratorium on any of those coming into town until you guys get a chance to talk about it. Um, one question under the term, it's just a blank. Is that something we would want to decide tonight? Yes. Okay. How long? Okay. And it's six up months, right? Or in I thought right. Mine just shows it as open ended. Yep, you, you need to decide how long you want to place this uh, hold on any new applications um, for this type of use. Uh, you can do it for, escapes me off the top of my head, I, I believe we can have a, six, or a year long initially, no more than a year. Mm -hmm. And during that time, uh, staff will study the existing city code provisions um, where they may or may not be allowed, under what conditions, and then come back to you with some findings and, and recommendations. Great, okay. Uh, with that said, should we open the public hearing? If anybody would like to address it. All right, we will open up the public hearing for the introduction and first reading of Ordinance 393, the interim ordinance establishing the moratorium. Would anybody like to speak regarding this issue? Mr. O'Gorman. Yeah, not a, it's making more sense now that I thought you were trying to head something off. That's what it appeared to me. But what I don't understand is like the fairgrounds 
that's all published. This was never published to my knowledge. And I don't know how you do an ordinance without publishing it prior to. And how does anybody know we're having a public hearing if you don't publish it? <laughs> and I think you made the comment, Matt, at one point. I don't remember specifically what it was, and it was, but but it was about well, how do people know? And I I don't know why anybody would want to know. I. You're, you're doing your business, but what I'm saying is you're, you've got an ordinance and it hasn't been published to my knowledge. And I would think that it, you would have to publish a public hearing, but otherwise, how does the public know it's having a hearing? Would you like to address that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members. The, the issue of notice is different from publish and publishing an ordinance. Publishing an ordinance comes after the fact before it becomes effective. Having a notice of a public hearing as a separate issue. Uh, state statute, in lieu of a provision uh, that's different in your city charter, state statute governs interim ordinances and except uh, with respect to certain types of uses, uh, be it a housing type use or you know, airports, uh, something not at issue tonight, there is no notice requirement. So putting it on your agenda as regularly done according to city business and practices is sufficient notices, notice for these purposes. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? <coughs> Public hearing take two. Public hearing take three. Hearing none, we will close the public hearing. Uh, council, discussion about the moratorium. When, when you said you had an inquiry, does that count as an, uh, uh, an official like they want? Okay, because so we won't be in any kind of jeopardy by saying we're putting the moratorium on with them and okay. No, there, there's been no application. A mere inquiry does not rise to that level, would not trigger any response times, for example, under Minnesota statute 1599. Um, you know, an inquiry brings it to the council's uh, attention through staff in order for you to take this next step to again, pause, take a breath and determine whether there needs to be changes in your code of ordinances. Well, and in this situation, I think a, a moratorium taking our time to do research to see uh, what would fit in that situation. Because as of right now, that is a private business and that building is just vacant, correct? So it is the business owners, what they decide uh, if they want to reopen, sell. But for us as a city to look at the zone, being part of the neighborhood, what would be best for the future? So I think. A moratorium for a year seems to be responsible to do the research to see what would what would be the best fit for our community and for that neighborhood. Mr. Mayor, I'd also add that the study would be looking not just simply at this particular use. You would be looking in a, a general mm -hmm. sense as to this community. use in general in terms of the entire community and specifically the RB district um, as it generated the discussion, but it's certainly not limited um, in to scope to one use. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions from the council? Well, what's the standard application process? So let's say it, it wasn't just an inquiry, it was an application. But what's just the standard process for mm -hmm. those that don't know? For development, so they would either have to come in with a building permit. So first they'd have to ask us for a building permit. Or a development application. Mm -hmm. And once the development application kicks in, and then clock starts, as long as it's a complete application. So in this, um, with this particular use in an RB zone, uh, it is not a permitted use. So what they would uh, need to do, any potential um, owner or prospective owner that wanted to make this particular use in the zone would have to submit an appropriate application for a conditional use permit. Once complete, the 60-day timer starts running. Um, you know, had this been an application, you would still be within your authority to enact the, the moratorium. So I just want to make sure that you know it, it didn't rise to that level. 
you know, you're, you're in the clear in terms of enacting the moratorium and then um, had the application process started, um, then there, you know, it goes into consideration and, you know, staff reviews it and as with all conditional use permits, the, the issue is in the details in terms of what those conditions would be. So if they, if they would still have to go through the conditional use permit process, what's the point? I mean, isn't that when you would do your due diligence? So what's the point of this, I guess? I mean, because that's what we did last time, right? That we had to change, we had to give them a conditional use permit. We had to do public hearings. Everybody provided their opinions and then we voted on it at that time. Um, so I guess I'm not. The thing with, uh, I don't want to keep saying last time, but they met all the legal things that we could not deny a conditional use permit. If we put this moratorium in place, it gives us, if we just, if we say a year, it gives us a year to make sure that we um, take all the necessary steps as far as it being in a residential vicinity. So that we, um, so um, although, like I say, the legal ramifications, the legal aspects, we could not, we couldn't not prevent them because um, they met all the aspects of the conditional use permit. Whereas now, if we put a moratorium on it, we can discuss it longer to make some more guidelines on what they would need to legally do or we could change it so it would not be permitted correct but boy that's a long way to say not a lot of anything <laughs> i understood what you're council member gesme council member cronenberger great questions and the, the distinction would be um it's kind of a, a blend of that answer that right now uh, there's a conditional use possibility there that if they come in and they have an application that meets those those conditions um, you know you do you do have flexibility to add other appropriate conditions on any conditional use permit but uh, with this type of use um, and the experiences that you've had do you know what those conditions would be to protect the city there's nothing in the code that suggests what those conditions might be. This, the moratorium gives you an opportunity before another use comes in to essentially be more specific on the conditions that you feel would be appropriate to this type of use um, so that all future uses are governed by those criteria, not just a very vague you know, undefined whatever conditions seem appropriate. You may not know that until you study it. And then under the conditional use, there's several conditional uses in different districts that have additional qualifications or requirements. That's what you would be looking to determine. One part of it is to determine if there needs to be some additional requirements for this particular use to make it compatible with surrounding uses. Or like Council Member Gesme said, maybe you move it somewhere else. Maybe we look at saying, mm, we don't really want to permit this type of use. We would look at all of those options uh, to determine, to help you determine how best to regulate the use. Any other questions, Diane? Um, so we could actually put it in a different zoning category if we want but i uh real question is when we say we're going to have a moratorium to begin the study how do we go to the next step and actually begin the study do you legally like bring us some options or do we have another work session or how do we go yes mm -hmm. first of all we'll uh lay it all out of what your what can be done in each district and then, yes, we will have a work session. Good. I, I so enjoy those, you know. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Anything else from the council? <clears throat> With that, I would look for a motion to approve the ordinance 393, the interim ordinance establishing the moratorium. And I suppose if uh, 
people are comfortable with the one year as Derek had brought up before? Or if that deserves discussion? I will make that motion with the one year inserted. And I'm going to second. Got a motion from Diane and a second from Mr. Gesme. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. That brings us to the consent agenda. Consent agenda items may be adopted under one motion as presented or may be removed for discussion and resolution as council business. Item A, just and correct claims, the accounting period that ended on April 13th. B, meeting minutes for March 7th, 2023, the city council work session. Item C, meeting minutes for April 4th, 2023, city council meeting. Item D, the second reading and adoption of Ordinance 392, authorizing the sale of the east half of vacated 9th Street adjacent to Block 8. Uh, item E, approve Lyons East Side Park plaque placement. Item F, approve the replacement of pool umbrellas and bases. Item G, approve purchase of sprayers for Public Works Department. Item H, approve the sale of the boom sprayer at auction. Item I, approve janitorial quote. Item J, approve the striping proposal. Item K, approve the VFW option agreement. Item L, approve sewer credit. Item M, approve John Birch Park fundraising sign. Item N, approve the pool manager and assistant managers. Item O, resolution 2680, accepting the donation of dugouts at Archie Swenson Fields from the Cannon Falls Youth Athletics uh, and the Parks Department. And item P, approve the 2022 library annual report. Are there any items from the consent agenda the council would like to pull down to council business? Can I pull down A? You'd like to pull down A? Yes. Okay, will do. Is there anything else from the council? Excuse me, can I, can I say something? <laughs> Hi, it's Nicole. Um, I just wanted to clarify that the library board annual report is not for you. You don't have to approve it. I'm j I just shared the information. It was already approved by the library board to submit to the, to the state. Thank you, Nicole. So I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Should we strike item P or just leave it in as that we recognize that it's on the agenda? Okay. Uh, Item A from Lisa, is there any other items from the council? Hearing none, I would take a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Motion by Gesme, do I have a second? I'll second. Please. Second from Ryan. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Carries. Uh, council business, we'll move that item A, the just and correct claims, we'll make that our first item. Okay. So, Lisa, you pulled it down, what would you like? Just curious for the our attorney fees, um, what they are all for, for this last date. Shelly or Neil, would you like to address that? Okay. I should have printed it. I didn't, I just fumbled through and found mine. <coughs> I think it's on the five page. Yep. There's one. So you're looking at uh, general services for twelve hundred and thirty dollars, uh, Cannon Valley Fair for seven hundred and eighty-one dollars, uh, the Mullenhauer uh, issue that we have for $40, Johnson, which is $495, that's the land. Um, lots that we're gonna be looking at for our reconstruction project. Um, Underdahl, that's our lot that we just uh, um, transferred over. Underdahl. Mm-hmm, then the thing went out on me. In the consent agenda. <laughs> Sorry, there you go. Uh, Malloy, which is uh, another lot purchase that we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, we've got data requests for $82.50. We got more data requests for $50. And we've got police and fire for 
So what are the two data requests? Why are they? Um, well, we have a tendency to get a lot of data requests. Okay. Um, and we have to bring those go to the attorneys? A lot of times the data requests are, uh, have to be redacted. Okay. And so we send them up to be redacted. If there's uh, private and public information in the, in the request, uh, the private information has got to be redacted. And that takes a lot of time. Okay. Uh, this happens to be, what, 130 bucks. Um, it's not very large this time, but you okay. wait till the next month. Charge for a data request? Do we? Yeah. Uh, a quarter a sheet. A quarter a sheet? If it's sent by um, electronic. Okay. Um, and then we just send it out, depending on what it is, yeah. Right. Do Our data requests are. Take much time? Take much time. Does it well, vary depending on the request? Yeah, some of them get pretty in depth. Okay. Um, I know one of my staff members spent five hours on uh, a data request here last week. Okay. It, uh, it gets very lengthy in times, and that's just one of my staff. Okay. Um, so do all staff do them, or? Depending on what, uh, what the request is. Okay. Um, if it gets sent over to the police department, uh, then that staff works on them, sends them up to Shelly for uh, uh, work. Um, then they come back to me uh, for review and then uh, get sent out. So it, it's, they're a lot of work. Don't let anybody kid you, they're, uh, they're a lot of work. And uh, they take a lot of staff time. Do we have an average of how many, how, like do we get a lot a year? Um, usually uh, not too many people send them in. Okay. Mainly one. Okay. Um, but they get to be, there get to be a quite a few. Are we able, can we, do we have a limit of how much time we spend on them or? No, we have to do them, um, but we do them as best we can. Okay. Um, with the Howards now missing, right. uh, things are, are getting pretty tight. We've got audit going on. We've got a lot of stuff going on and, and uh, it, uh, it, it takes away a lot of time. Can we limit how much we can do per week? Can we block off like four hours on a Tuesday, four hours on a Thursday? We, uh, we got to reasonably provide the data. Mm -hmm. That's fair to say. Yeah, so under the Data Practices Act, um, some of these are going to trump anything else that's going on uh, with respect to city staff. It's, it's got to pull them away. Um, you risk violating the Data Practices Act if you don't respond within a reasonable period of time. And what's reasonable depends on the request. So if the request is for one document, you've got to jump on it. If the request is for multiple documents, for multiple agencies or commissions, uh, multiple staff, multiple layers, then, then that can be done in a lengthier period of time. And there may be opportunities to, as you say, sort of manage the costs and, and how you mm -hmm. do it. But at the end of the day, you're going to incur those costs because the, the Data Practices Act is mandatory. Uh, there are, in some circumstances, you can charge the requester, but uh, you can't charge someone who comes in to view data. You can only charge them if you produce data to them. Okay. So someone can want every single piece of data in your file you would be responsible to pull it, and if they only want to view it, you'd have to eat the cost to produce it, uh, or excuse me, to pull it and make it available. Sounds expensive. It very much can be, yes. Okay. Well, that answers my questions. Any other questions? Uh, I would take a motion to approve our just and correct claims in the accounting period that ended on April 13th. <coughs> Motion from Diane. Second. Second from Derek. Any further discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Moving on to item B, the Malloy Lot Purchase Agreement. Neil. We approved the uh, 2023 reconstruction project, uh, at, I believe at the last meeting, um, that would be the lift station and the uh, river crossing. With that, um, we need part of Rich and Page Malloy's lot, that one right by Third Street that the two corners touch in the middle of the street. 
Um, we have come to terms with it. Uh, the purchase price is $30,270.58. Um, it's approximately 1.14 acres. That's about as small as we can get without uh, cramping things in there. Um, the, the problem we have today is there's a uh, mortgage on, the, on that lot and we have to request a partial release, which is $250, and do an appraisal to make sure there's uh, uh, adequate payment for the amount of land that's being released. So what the request is today um, is to uh, approve the purchase agreement for 30270 and also we'll have to uh, uh, pick up the release application fee of 250 and then get our, get our appraisal done. The bank will do the appraisal, but they'll just send us the, uh, the invoice. Any questions or discussion regarding the Malloy lot purchase agreement? Do we have any idea how much that appraisal is going to cost? They said anywhere between 1000 and 1500 But they didn't <coughs> say exact, no. Any other questions or discussion? Make a motion to enter the agreement. Okay. The Richmond page. Motion's been made by Mr. Gesme. Do I have a second? A second. We have a second from Lisa. Uh, any further discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> and it carries the Malloy Lot Purchase Agreement. Uh, moving on, item C, the 2023 to 2027 fire contracts for Cannon Falls Township and Cannon Valley Rural Fire Association. Okay, we, uh, we met, the uh, Finance Committee met and talked to uh, representatives of uh, Cannon Falls Fire Department and the, uh, the, uh, the other fire, the other, what's it the called? Township Association? Township Association. We agreed to a 4% increase over the next five years, 4% per year. And then starting immediately, we're gonna meet with uh, the fire chief and the townships and come to some type of uh, agreement after these five years to realign our, our costs and discuss other options. Um, so with that, Yes. One other thing, Steve, this is not necessarily part of the agreement, but we are going to hopefully start uh, getting better with our billing um, for services when, when uh, need be, and that will hopefully bring in a little more revenue too. Any discussion regarding the fire contract with our local townships? Hearing none, I'd take a motion to approve the 2023 to 2027 fire contract with Cannon Falls and Cannon Valley Rural Fire Association. So moved. Motion second. from Diane and a second from Derek. <coughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. It carries. That moves us on to item D, uh, the WHKS Professional Service Agreement for Phase 1 of the Hardwood Estates. Laura. If you would like to take that one. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, the EDA had a special meeting last week to uh, review a professional service agreement with WHKS. Um, we've been, back in February, you approved um, an agreement for us to start working on some preliminary plans, some concept plans and everything. And so we've narrowed it down to uh, a, a layout, finally. And so now we have, uh, we're ready to start proceeding with the first phase. And with that, the, um, in your packet you had the scope of services and that would include the design, bid, construction, engineering phases. Um, and that also will include, and that was in my memo I had miss, um, typed, miswritten, I don't know how you want to say it, um, that the administrative expenses were not included, the 10% was not included, and that was wrong. They are included in that amount that was in there, so, um, so that 
Um, so I guess that's that's good news that that's already included in that uh, 132.5. So um, I would entertain any questions if you have, but uh, the first phase would include about 29 lots, and that would be coming off of 72nd Avenue Way where those first row of houses are already established because the infrastructure goes to the end of that road. So we're going to continue heading south and then kind of wrapping west toward the cemetery would be the plan. So um, um, like I said, I'd entertain any questions that you might have. Otherwise, we would, uh, the EDA would um, ask for approval for supporting the financing of the agreement and the expenses for that phase one. Do you know about how long you're would be between phases? Like, is it about one a year or is it? You know, it depend? all depends on how quickly the lots sell. I mean, we're really hoping that they, um, you know, that they, that builders will want to buy multiple lots at a time and, you know, kind of. So if um, there's a bunch sitting empty, we won't just start building correct, another phase. Correct. Because okay. the idea is, um, you know, we have a four year contract for deed on the property. Mm -hmm. And so will the EDA is able to, you know, we'll be able to make those payments um, over the next four years. But the phases will roll out as we sell the lots, then, you know, we'll roll that into uh, the next, uh, the next phases. And, you know, and I do just want to add that caveat that I know that at the February meeting that there was um, discussion or concern about us competing with the private sector. And, you know, our motivation is very different, you know, with the you know, the EDA or the city is not looking at, you know, trying to make a profit on this. You know, our, our goal is to get butts and seats at the school, you know, increase the workforce, uh, increase the number of homeowners that there could be in the city and, you know, get to us to our 5,000 population as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and the other developments, um, I'm hoping that they happen, but, you know, we haven't really heard much from them. Um, you know, I mean, interest rates are, can, you know, they keep going up. Um, so we hope that they come, but again, they're a totally different market than what we're looking for. So um, are there any other questions that anyone has? Hearing none, I would uh, take a motion to approve the professional service agreement for phase one of Hardwood Estates. Yes. Not questions for Laura, but before we actually vote on it, just some comments about the proposal in general. <coughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> um, and I am not opposed to housing. And I sit on the planning commission, and I've been excited about you know everything from Greensmith to Jablonski to Endress housing proposals. Uh, they're all private developers, and they bear the financial burden of making those dreams come true. We are now being asked to approve 100. In addition to the 15,000 we've already proved, now we're going for 132 or what thousand some dollars for this. Um, if if we sell the lot, it, it, at some point it was said that we'd have to sell the lots on an average of 60,000 each for the first 29 in order to get out of it what we've put in, which means basically we're asking the taxpayers of Cannon Falls to upfront. Well, like $1.7 million of taxpayer money to pay for the engineering studies and all of the infrastructure that, that needs to be done for this project. And then I'm assuming it's going to roll, and that's only phase one of four, and then I'm assuming they're going to use that money to roll over and build out phase two, phase three, and, and phase four. So we're looking at four or five years of taxpayer money disappearing into a housing project. Um, and I guess, so the real question I have is being, we've been told we don't pay our police enough. You know, we need to raise the salaries for the police and probably all of public safety. We probably are underpaying most of the folks that work for the city of Cannon Falls. We don't have enough money to update our website or get any help to do that. I just, I don't know where this money is coming from. That's never been pointed out. I, it wasn't requested before the 2023 budget was approved, so I don't know, you know, what's going to suffer. What money that should be used somewhere else are we going to use for this development? And so I, I just have some real 
concerns about the fact that um, this is taxpayers' money. It's not private developer money that they can, you know, make the decision if they want to risk it. We're, we're talking about the taxpayers of, of Cannon Falls, and it's just a lot of money that we might have diverted from other things the city needs to do over the next five years. That was my concern. Any other questions, comments, or concerns or discussion? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve WHKS Professional Service Agreement for Phase 1 of the Hardwood Estates. So moved. Second. Got a motion from Derek, second from Mr. Gesme. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Aye. So it's a 4-2 to two vote. And it carries. Uh, moving on to reports, uh, Chamber of Commerce, Maggie is not present tonight. Uh, we'll go around the uh, horn with the uh, heads first. Sarah, is there anything you'd like to add tonight? Laura, anything else? Lieutenant Berg. So we had an interesting Monday morning. <laughs> Unfortunately, that affected the school. So I want to thank everybody that uh, cooperated and understood um, we received the call at 7-11 in the morning. I got over to the high school as fast as I could to meet with the superintendent. And because he's always at school early on a Monday morning, we were able to get the message out that, hey, we got to freeze things down and make sure that we could find the person that was making this threat. Um, it was 7.45 when I found that subject and I was able to report to the school that, hey, He's here, he's not at school, he's not on his way to school, we can open back up. So um, definitely had that in the back of my head. There's kids on buses, I saw buses pulled over. How long is this gonna be? Mm -hmm. We just went through a very long process a month ago and that is not what I wanted to see as kids sitting on buses. So yep. believe me when I said um, I wasn't waiting for somebody to go to that house, I was going to that house to try to find that subject. Um, and fortunately, everything was safe. Nobody was hurt. Kids got to school on time, as far as I heard. Definitely a handful of upset parents. We were able to contact a few of them today and express our side and the importance of safety to the public and especially our children that go to the schools. So I just want to thank everybody. And um, definitely, if they have any questions, unlikely for much information to come out since it's a juvenile that's involved. So mm -hmm. I just want to thank everybody for their patience. That's what I have. Thank you very much for that. Shelly, anything from you? No. Neil. One thing, uh, uh, the Public Works Commission made a motion to put an interview committee together. Um, Laura's on it. Matt, you're on it. I need one more from the council. Uh, I would nominate or uh, do a, a point or nominate, or does it have to be approved? I, or I need a council person. I would uh, ask. Mr. Gesme, if he's able to do that. Uh, when do you plan on meeting? I believe tomorrow afternoon, 4 o'clock. Tomorrow afternoon is when they're scheduled. So okay. whoever yeah, can uh, do it. Out, I sure can. Um, and then, uh, sorry? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. And then uh, the zoning administrator is going to close on Friday. Um, it's not looking real good on applications. Uh, maybe we, if you would consider sitting in on that one also, and we could have a discussion after tomorrow night sure. on next steps. Okay. Because uh, I don't know. We'll see. We got two days. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the EDA meeting, Laura, if you'd like to add anything else. Otherwise, I believe the majority of it was covered here tonight uh, in our WHKS uh, phase one. Uh, Park Board met on April 6th. I believe everything. <clears throat> Sorry, I believe everything we talked about was on the consent agenda, agenda tonight. Yep. Great. Uh, Public Works Commission also met on the 6th. Yes, and I everything was on the consent agenda. Wonderful. Uh, Finance Committee, that was also addressed. That was the contract with the fire. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then the library board, uh, Nicole, if there's anything you'd like to say, but that report was also included in our consent agenda. If there's anything you'd okay. like to add? 
Um, yeah, hi. Uh, well, I just kind of wanted to say hi, because I haven't been in a meeting in a while, but kind of also give you an update of some things that are going to be going on at the library. We, um, I've been talking with the community or with the senior center with Laura Bremer from the senior center. And because of the construction that's going to be going on at the school, Canon Kids will be at this community center. And then a lot of programs that are at the senior center will also kind of be unhoused. So we're working with them with the senior center to try to, to bring some of the programs over to the library for the summer. So there will be a lot more activity than normal. We're anticipating that summer reading is going to be like pre-COVID levels based on the kind of foot traffic that we're getting in the library within the last few months. And that is just an absolutely wonderful thing. I'm really happy to see people coming back and using the library in all of the ways that it was used before. One thing I did want to highlight to you today is that in the um, the annual report that I showed you and my explanation of the things that we started during the pandemic and that we've decided to keep up with, one of them is the YouTube channel. And we started doing craft programs once a month. And we started doing, well, we had been doing them before COVID, but we started to make them hybrid so that people could do the crafts either at the library or if they couldn't come, then they could, we record it and post it on our YouTube channel. So Angie posted yesterday's craft or this month's craft at 6 p.m. last night. And by like two o'clock this afternoon, we already had about 300 views. So we're really getting a lot of traffic that way. So that that's one of the ways that we're also factoring in use is how people are interacting with us online and in person. And I really want to highlight that library work is not what it used to be. It's not just checking out books to people and connecting people only with books. It's really, really a lot of different kinds of literacy and helping people learn things because libraries are places where people learn from cradle to grave. And we've really, really embraced that since our strategic plan from 2021. So yeah, we have lots of fun things coming up, but I really wanted to just kind of highlight those things for you about the annual report. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, council members, if you have anything, Laura? Lisa? I do not. Ryan? Eric? Diane? A uh, special thanks to again the police for once again being with especially our young people in the schools. And also a thanks to everybody who showed up for the, um, I think it's the Cannon Falls Educational Foundation fundraiser the other night. Uh, does do a great job of, of raising funds for our, uh, for our uh, schools. Steve, anything from you? I have nothing. Uh, I pretty. Oh, Laura, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that um, in the consent agenda, we did approve tonight um, giving part of the VFW parking lot to the, well, it's our parking lot, but giving that to the VFW so that they can expand their upper level into a deck. So mm -hmm. they're going to be working on that. So that's, I think that's ex pretty exciting for um, entertainment in the town. Yeah. Um, of course, they're going to be starting their fundraising, so they'll be looking for money. But I just think that's a, a cool thing for our, our city. Yep. It's going to be a beautiful deck with the view to the falls there. I mean, the computer imaging, it's its yeah. a great location. It's Absolutely. Stunning. That's why, uh, is it Veterans Lane? Is that the name of the road? I know that a resident a couple of years ago had said, because we had talked about if it should be a trail or a bike trail or whatever, and they said it's the, the best view they can get of the falls is to just drive up there. And I'm like, well, once that deck is completed, that might be the best view of the falls, yeah. being elevated. And, looking over there. Yeah. Uh, I don't really have anything uh, too big. I just I wanted to say thank you to the police also because uh, the, two things. They acted with an abundance of caution and they took something seriously that I think some people might have written off and said, oh, it's just a kid on social media or whatever the situation was making a threat. Uh, but when you think about in today's day and age, if you don't take those threats seriously and something is to happen, uh, you can't go back on that. So the fact that we acted with an abundance of caution and put kids' safety uh, as a priority, I think that was handled uh, about as well as uh, possibly could be. The other part is the parents that complained about 
sitting on the bus for five or 10 minutes or complained about the drop off or complained about the, that. Uh, I just ask people to have a little grace and a little patience when our law enforcement is dealing with a situation that could be as serious as the threat of someone's life and you're complaining about sitting on a bus for five to 10 minutes. Perspective means a lot because they weren't just going after the subject. They said the well-being of the entire community is in play here. And they were being preventative and finding that subject and treating the situation. They handled it perfectly. And uh, that was with the idea of the safety of all the kids in our entire district that would be in that building at that time. And at the end of the day, it, classes started at like 8.15. So well done. And uh, I just asked parents to uh, be a little bit more, uh, have some perspective and appreciate the services that we have. So uh, with that, I would take a motion to adjourn. I, move. I got a motion from Steve. I got a second from Diane. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.